Well, I think we've had some pretty cool guests on the Fosspod thus far. I'm, I am, I have been thrilled with the quality of guests we have attracted for this fledgling show. Uh, that said, I don't believe we have yet had a necromancer on the show. Um, I'm a little scared now. <laughs> don't be scared. I, I watched Evil Dead. I know how this goes. You, you you go to the cabin in the woods. It's it's Memorial Day weekend. I'm going to a cabin in the woods. You you go into the basement late at night. You dig up the hole. The light's there. And then all of a sudden, wham, you know, I'll swallow your soul. Klaatu Verata uh, open source. Shh. shh. <laughs> okay, I shouldn't say that. Stop it. Okay. It's a fr- friendly, ne- a hardware software necromancer, a friendly necromancer. Oh, dude. Whew. Dude, we got Foon Turing on the show. What? Really? We got, you, you were there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, I, like I, was, I was doing a bit. I, no, it's awesome. Foon, Foon uh, is coming on to talk about a project you may have seen in the news lately, mm-hmm. and uh, we will get into it right after the music plays. Welcome to the Foss Pod. I'm Will. I'm Brad. Hello, Brad. Hi. This episode of the Foss Pod is brought to you by Google Open Source, which brings all of the power of open source to Google and all the power of Google to open source. You can find out more about open source at Google by going to opensource.google. Mm-hmm. Will, we are talking to none other than Twitter's own Foon Turing on this episode. Yeah, I, I can't overestimate how good a Twitter follow Foon is. The breadth and scope of projects that come up on their Twitter feed is exceptional, and I always learn something interesting. Yes, they refer to themselves, I think, uh, quite legitimately as a hardware software necromancer, and like that's kind of exactly what they get up to on Twitter all the time, is like, hey, here's this extremely old esoteric computer, or this old like DOS, I don't know, graphics program, or you know, you know what I mean? Like They, they specialize in old stuff that doesn't work anymore and finding ways to get it to work in, in just like endlessly fascinating investigative kind of ways. Well, Hey, I have a file from a program that hasn't existed in 26 years and I need to figure out how to open it in something more current and get the data out. Who do you call for that? Is that like a file busters situation or do you just, do you just <laughs> call Foon Turing? I think. Yes. I think that's probably a safe bet. Yeah. Like we're mostly here to talk about 3d movie maker, which is a, an old Microsoft release from 1995 that came out right alongside Windows 95 that uh, you may have seen in the news that uh, Foon was instrumental in convincing Microsoft to open source recently. And there's a whole fascinating scene around that situation, around what they're going to do with that code, which is the main thrust of this episode. But then, you know, we also have just a broad conversation with Foon about all kinds of other topics, like other old projects they'd like to target for resurrection What's in their necromancy toolbox? I don't think, I guess a necromancer doesn't have a toolbox. Like what are they, a spell book? Toolbox. A spe- toolbox is good. <laughs> okay. But yeah, but yeah, yeah. If you're, if you're interested in old computing stuff and, and the process of getting stuff like that open sourced, like I, I think this is a very fascinating conversation. And there's also an interesting bit about the process of archiving what is now ancient software, right? Mm-hmm. Software from the 90s is more than 20 years old. We're looking at you know, it's it predates the idea of source control in the way that we think about it now using Git or even like something like SVN or something like that that's now also ancient. Oh man. So there are some there there's one fascinating tidbit about getting this software to compile now that I would love to drop here, but I'll let I'll let people hear it in the interview, but it's so cool. <laughs> there's no better way to start this than to just get into the episode with Foon right now. We're here to talk about 3D Movie Maker today, which was a piece of software it's funny. I remember Microsoft making a big deal about this around the time of the Windows 95 launch, and then it just disappeared immediately. Like, like it kind of went away for a lot of people. And I, I was maybe too old for it at the time, I, I guess, as a 20-year-old or 22-year-old, something like that. Can you tell us a little bit about it and, like, what your experience with was it? What, what experience? So, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it showed up in some of the early, like, commercials for Windows 95, and it was supposed to be a Windows 95 launch date same day launch kind of thing. I'm not exactly sure if it came out on that day. I, you know, finding uh, details on like stuff this old is kind of tricky. But yeah, so it was like one of the part of their sort of multimedia kids toy line kind of to go with uh, creative writer and fine artist, which were two kind of similar programs. But yeah, I first started playing with it around like 1996, 97. So very shortly after Windows 95 came out um, and me and my siblings 
played it so much that we actually damaged the CD we had just from, you know, having to put it in and out of the CD player so often with, you know, little kid fingers. So it just got damaged. And like, I remember like there were like two years where we, we just couldn't play it and we were just wanting to play it again. We eventually found that a, a family friend had a copy and we're like, we need to borrow that right now. So, yeah. Can you describe what it actually was, what you used it for, what the tool was? So, yeah. So, the, the basic way the tool works, I mean, it's got a lot of sort of complexity around it where it's kind of got this sort of mist-like theater you can explore and characters you can talk to. But at its core is this studio. And the way the studio works is it's kind of like a digital play. You've got a setting, like a background. You put sort of 3D actors into it. You pick actions for them to do, and you have a timeline so you can make them do different things at different times. And then you just add, you know, voices and sound effects. So it's a very simple way to build animations in 3D that really, I don't think anything else is really um, met it at its level. But it's like, it's, it's very simple to use. You can very quickly make a very basic movie. I mean, it won't look great or anything, but you'll get the idea across. And it just has a sort of perfect difficulty curve where it's, you can learn pretty much most of what you need to know within five minutes of playing with it. So perfect for kids. And it has sort of a long tail of people doing more complex things with it that, it, that were never intended. How extensible was it out of the box before anybody started modding it? Did it have any kind of capacity for adding new 3D models or new sound effects or anything? Or was it literally just what's in the box? That's all you've got to work with? Brand, when it, out of the box, there was absolutely no modding. Basically, the only things you could like bring into it that weren't part of it were voices and MIDI files. That was basically it. So you can add in some new MIDI background music and you can record your voice. It even had a thing that you recorded your voice directly into the program just because they didn't expect that you'd know how to use you know, the sound recorder. And of course, Audacity didn't exist. So it's like you're out of the box. This was a very sort of closed box thing. That, that's kind of a weird way to say that. Japan actually got an add-on that added a few more characters from the Doraemon anime, but uh, that never came out in America or anywhere else in the world from that matter. I mean, younger listeners may, may not realize this, but in, in today when we all have phones that have 3D acceleration and cameras and microphones and all that stuff just that are in our pockets that we don't think about anymore, like I don't think I had a microphone on my computer in 1995. Like having CD-ROMs was pretty new at that point. So having the ability to run this software, like having a real sound card rather than just the one piezoelectric speaker on your computer that would beep and bloop when your computer had errors was pretty novel in 1995-96 when this was new. Yeah, definitely. Um, in fact, an early version of the program didn't do voices. It had instead sort of comic book text bubbles. Um, and that's actually one of the places that the Comic Sans font was designed for was to let you put you know, little text bubbles on your characters. And then as the project developed, I guess they decided, nah, enough people have sound cards and such, and we can use this to push multimedia. So we'll make it, you know, full voices and such. I didn't expect this to be the origin story of Comic Sans, but here we are. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of a shared, uh, I'll say blame between this and Microsoft Bob. <laughs> Uh, depending on exactly when you ask the creator of Comic Sans, it's either a 3D movie maker early on or it's Microsoft Bob. The Microsoft Bob story is basically that he saw, you know, a little dog in Microsoft Bob talking and the talking was in either Arial or Times New Roman. And his immediate reaction was dogs don't talk in that font. So he's like, <laughs> I'm going to go make you a font that works for a dog. The 90s were a different time. There were some questionable decisions being made. Yeah. You did a great job on Twitter as as this open sourcing was playing out of kind of walking through, like, here's what the community is like these days. You know, here's the biggest repository for people's work. And like, you know, you pointed out within days of this tweet going up, somebody has uploaded new movies, right? Like there's still yeah. a community there. Prior to the opening of the code over the last 20-ish, 25 years, was there a big modding scene for the program itself? I mean, did people build out the ability to do more with it than was intended before they had access to the code? Oh, yes. A lot of work has been done over the years on adding new functionality to the software. Sort of a, an inherent problem with adding stuff to the software is that it doesn't export movies as like an MP4 file or an AVI file. It saves them as just sort of a binary representation of what actors are where. The idea being that this made it really easy to upload them over dial-up, to copy them around on a floppy disk, you know, because it was designed in 1995. They don't expect anyone to have the bandwidth to host AVIs. So... This makes it hard to add a new character because then you have to make sure it's installed on the person who's watching the movie's computer beforehand because it's going to be just referencing it and not knowing what it was. So with a couple of people doing some reverse engineering of the file formats, we started out with doing some stuff where 
there's something called Nickelodeon 3D Move Maker, which is basically the exact same thing, but Nickelodeon created their own 3D models for it, their own backgrounds, put in some of their own voices. Basically, before we could figure out how to make our own 3D models, we took the ones out of that and then modified them so that they could be put back into 3D Movie Maker. So instead of having to pick between one of the two programs, you kind of got one program that was the best of both worlds where you could use both the original 3D Movie Maker characters and backgrounds and the Nickelodeon ones. And then from there, some more complicated things were built, such as V3DMIM, which actually does a complicated thing where it virtualizes the file system out from under the program so that when you load up a movie, it kind of acts like you've just installed new expansions and then can use them directly out of it, which really made it possible for people to create a movie and then create a new actor, a new texture, whatever, for that specific movie, rather than having to focus on, here's a gen general sort of actor that I want everyone to use that's gonna be one of the five that everyone has. This made it much more specific and useful. It seems like Microsoft's blue sky for this when they were making it may have been to like, that this was a platform for where they'd keep selling expansions with new characters and new sets and stuff like that, or, or does that seem realistic? I think so, yeah. They put in functionality to let that be done from the beginning to let there be multiple sort of expansions added in. And like I said, it only got used in Japan for the Doraemon, and then Nickelodeon basically went and made a completely separate program that does not interact with the original in any way. But I think if this program had been more successful, Microsoft happily would have kept on building, like, you know, the 1995 equivalent of DLC, where, you know, you can get an actor pack, you can have ones that are customized for your favorite shows or whatever. But apparently the program did not sell terribly well at retail, so it never really got that push. So before they release the source, and I realize that, that this is actively in flux right now, there's a ton of projects forking on GitHub every moment, it seems like. What would I have to do to run this, to like play an old 3D Movie Maker file two months ago? Like, what, what, what are the hoops for that? So the software actually works surprisingly well on modern Windows, but it still has some issues with installing because I think parts of it are 16-bit, which doesn't work well on modern 64-bit Windows. There's actually a guide on the 3D Movie Maker site, which is basically like, how do you get this installed? But it does have some, you know, incompatibilities. It's, it's still a matter of just finding the ISO and getting this installed. And then you have to, on top of that, install various other things because you have to have the correct expansions, the correct add-ons and such in order to be able to watch most movies made by the community. Because no, people were not making sort of vanilla movies as often anymore. They can be played out of box with the standard software. You need you need the expansions and you need the V3DMIM sort of thing. Interesting. And so this is a little bit of a regression to an earlier conversation. But when you look at this, do you see, I don't know how much you keep up with the current scene of what the kids are doing. But like kids these days are making the same kind of movies that I, I would think you would have made in this, in 3D Movie Maker, in stuff like Minecraft and Roblox, where they have like fairly extensive control over the world, but in a more oddly corporately constrained way in a lot of cases? Yeah, I think so. The The real difference I've seen, though, is that there's a lot bigger barrier to entry with things like Roblox, Minecraft, things like that. Because generally to do those sort of things, you need something like Source Filmmaker, which is designed more to be on the level of modifying individual vertexes, building your own animations, that kind of thing, which is, you know, it's great flexibility to have when you want to make a movie exactly how you want it. However, it inherently builds a lot more complexity into it and makes it a lot more difficult to make movies. One of the great things about 3D Movie Maker is that because you don't have that ability, you're just sort of picking which animation your character's playing at once, you can make it very simple. You can make your movie very quickly and simply because you just don't go into that incredible amount of depth to make it perfect because you can't. The, the so, constraints, it turns out, shape the art, right? Exactly, yeah. So I think the public narrative around the way this has played out as it's blown up in the headlines is kind of like, oh, you know, popular Twitter user tweets at Trillion Dollar Corporation and they just say, here's some source, right? But like, I, I gather that you've actually been working on this for quite a bit longer than that. Can you can you take us back through like what your earlier prior efforts have been to to get this thing opened up? Yeah. So like a friend of mine on the, the 3D Movie Maker forums went and looked back in their own personal history and found the earliest mention they could find of someone asking Microsoft for the source was from around 2003. So we basically been asking for this for like 20 years. I distinctly remember early on, like in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a period where it was kind of like, let's see if we can like petition Microsoft to make a 3D Movie Maker 2. But as time went on, that became less and less likely. So it turned into, hey, we've got programmers in this community. Let's just make our own. 
let's get them to give us the source and make our own kind of thing. And then there have been attempts to make our own without the source, just either breaking with compatibility of the past or trying to figure out enough reverse engineering to make it compatible. But as, as for my own, like, you know, sort of Twitter thing, it's, I joked on Reddit where this subject came up. It's like, it's less that I just asked and they gave it to me. It's more that I've been asking about this on and off for years and years. Often as a joke, I have a long history of joking about breaking into Microsoft with a heist team to steal all their archives, mainly to get 3D Move Maker. And it's really more that I have been doing that on and off for months and years, and I eventually did it at the right time with a big enough audience, and it got to the right people. So it finally had an effect. Before your Twitter thread gained traction and this really got going, how worried were you that the source didn't even exist anymore? I mean, do you have a sense of what the archival practices are like at a at software companies as kind of big and old as Microsoft? I mean, do you know if there was any care taken to even preserve it or is it more of a haphazard like, well, it might be there, it might not? Well, so my understanding is I, I follow some like Microsoft archivists on uh, Twitter and I, I've understood from what I've heard, heard from them basically is that, you know, there is a pretty good archival process. My question was always kind of, does it go back that far? Because the thing about these kind of archival things is as you go far enough back, you get into the point where you're not just talking about whether they archived it. It's did they archive it and did that archive make it into the next archive and did that archive make it into the next archive? It's like 27 years is a long time. And it's like they may have archived it and then they lost those tapes or they archived it and they switched away from that you know database or whatever. And now it's just lost. So one of the things I kind of was like sort of settling for a while back was basically just adding the Microsoft people I knew and going like, is there any chance you can just look in your archives and just tell me if you have this? I, I, I'm not saying, you know, leak it to me, although I did joke about that, but <laughs> just, just tell me if you've got it. And for a while, the first couple of people I talked to were like, no, I can't find it anywhere. Uh, it took several people to go through before I finally found someone who was able to look deep enough because apparently it was originally on tape and then got moved over to a some kind of cloud service. And, you know, it, it's not in the sort of normal place where these kind of projects would be. I don't know what that is since I'm not a Microsoft employee, but they were able to finally dig deep enough and go like, yeah, there's definitely something there. So once I, I knew that it still existed, that gave me a lot more hope to actually ask for it. You've talked about Scott Hanselman at, at Microsoft being integral to this process. Uh, once your Twitter thread really got traction and you figured out there was some interest there, what was it like behind the scenes? I mean, was there still a lot of like convincing you had to do? Was there like any institutional support inside Microsoft at all? Or was this more just kind of like a labor of love that Scott took on himself? Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of convincing I had to do behind the scenes. It kind of seems that like once the ball started rolling, it was pretty much going to happen. The question was always are we going to be able to do this for legal reasons? One of the difficulties of open sourcing 3D Movie Maker is that Microsoft doesn't own 100% of it. They, at the time, uh, DirectX didn't really exist yet or it wasn't really ready to go. So they had um, licensed the Brinder library from Argonaut, which is a UK games company. And they used their 3D rendering library. And therefore it was the question of, can we release this with the Brinder code? Because they don't own Brinder. And if they have to pull that part out, we might end up being handed a bunch of code that we'll never build because the 3D rendering part is just gone. Fortunately, basically because of this project, I was able to get in touch with Jez Sand, the former CEO of Argonaut, and get Brinder open source beforehand. So we basically got a sort of general, you know, go ahead on releasing anything Brinder. There's still parts of the 3D Movie Maker source tree that haven't been released yet because they're owned by other companies. And that's still being talked on. And, you know, we're not sure if that's ever going to make it out. But it kind of was always a case of this is probably going to happen as long as none of the lawyers point out a big problem that means we can't do it. So a lot of what I was doing was tracking down, you know, who owns this code? Who can we get in touch with? Who can we talk to to get the, uh, the appropriate approvals? Right. That was actually my favorite part of your original Twitter thread is when you identify that the renderer is under separate ownership. And then you just mm -hmm. casually mentioned like, well... It's not that big a deal to just yank it out and write our own. I mean, how prepared yeah. were you to get going on that before you heard from, from Jez and actually got that part open sourced as well? I mean, do you have much 3D graphics experience or did you kind of envision that as more of a, a community effort uh, on the rendering side? I'd actually had some experience already doing that. And the thing about Brender is that we didn't have any SDKs or anything for it. 
So part of one of the things that the community has been doing over the past 20 years is sort of trying to get information about that. It turns out that um, IBM shipped a copy of the SDK on an OS2 developer connection disk. And we found that one. Therefore, we had a pretty similar version of the library that we could use to sort of match up symbols and figure out what is where and then look through the technical manuals in a weird OS2 help format. And then from that, I started building tools to kind of bolt a secondary render onto the original one in the closed source version of 3D Movie Maker in order to um, render outside the program. So I was already, you know, getting ready for that sort of thing and had some experience with doing it. So I'm really curious, like you talk about using OS2, an ancient version of Windows. I'm curious what you're like, do you just have a bunch of old systems running around or using VMs? What's your approach for tools to, to like do software archaeology and recreate these what are now ancient environments? It's actually a little bit of everything. Like to start out with, I do have a big pile of VMs, like, you know, a bunch of versions of 95, 98, a bunch of DOS, Windows 3.1, and then various NTs, uh, and then, you know, less common operating systems. I've also got a bunch of hardware on hand because it's surprisingly common that you find something that will not work in a VM because, you know, it's like we think of VMs as being just, you know, it's just like a real computer, but no, there's things that don't work. And sometimes you need to get an actual hardware to make it work. That plus a whole bunch of emulators because, you know, I'm often having to do stuff with like Apple II and classic Macs and such. So, yeah, it's kind of a matter of having a whole bunch of different tools on hand or at least something close enough that you can you can sort of press into the appropriate, you know, place as needed. Just right before this whole project happened, I was helping with another company that was like, they had a bunch of old soft image files and they're like, we haven't been able to open these since 2004. So is there any chance you could help us like figure out how to get these onto a modern system? And I'm like, I've not used soft image, but sure, I'll go look into this. So I was able to basically figure out you need to open them in this old version. And then from the old version, you can save them out into the new format and then it'll work. And it was just a matter of setting up a bunch of VMs, getting the right old versions and then playing around with them until I could get all the files to work right. Necromancy. <laughs> yep. Indeed. Uh, like what's your daily driver like for a computing environment? Like what, what OS do you run? Like what kind of hardware do you run? Like what's your sort of test bench? Is, is that is that something you, that you're easily able to detail? Not, not really. And it, it's actually kind of a funny story because I often like, you know, I get on Twitter and I complain about a problem I'm having with Windows and people are like, you know, you should just use Linux or sometimes vice versa. And the kind of funny thing about those kind of questions is it, it kind of fundamentally misunderstands how I use computers. Like I'm sitting in front of a KVM right now. I've got, I think, two Linux monitors, three Windows monitors and a Mac. But the Mac's turned off right now, but it's like, I do so much computing, I'm not at the point where I can choose to use a operating system. It's I have to be able to have a Mac for that, a Linux for that, Windows for this, and then I'm probably running Linux inside of Windows, then a you know, bunch more emulators. So it's kind of, I, I can't have a single sort of, this is the environment I want to use, and I want to you know just sit down and just use this. I've got it set up how I want. It's because I've got to have so many other things. I, I joked about this on Twitter a while ago, is that like one of the huge downsides to being a retro computerist is that you never get away from old versions of software. It's like, you can think like, yeah, Windows XP was a great improvement on Windows 95. And it was, but I'm still using Windows 95. I have to, you know, to be able to run old programs and such. So it's like, you know, the problems of the past never go away if you're, you know, an archivist. I'm always jealous of people who whose work computers can fit in a laptop. <laughs> like who, who can right. just take their thing and go someplace else and work. I mean, that seems nice. I have monitors everywhere. You mentioned once the ball got rolling with Microsoft that the you know legal hurdles obviously were a, a big obstacle to overcome. Uh, you've ended up putting everything out under the MIT license. What made that the license of choice for this? And was was that your choice, or did they and and Jez have a lot of input on on that? So for that, um, Microsoft had apparently picked that as sort of like the license on a early version of the repo, like um, sort of like a preliminary work. And then while that was like, getting ready to be launched, I got approval to license the Brender stuff. And Jez's approval was basically just, hey, you can release this. No information about license or anything like that. And then it's just sort of a follow-up of try to credit the people who made it. So I basically was like, well, it's going in an MIT repo eventually. I'll just make this MIT as well. And then put a bunch of info in the readme about who I think made it kind of thing, which has actually been kind of a fun research project on its own because I had to look up an old manual, grab all the um, credits from that, and then ask a couple of the programmers, like, 
Does, is this missing anybody that I should add onto here? Because it's I have a manual from around 95 and the program was still developed around until around 99. So people who worked on later versions wouldn't have necessarily shown up. Sure. Brender was used for kind of a, maybe not a lot of games, but it was at the time software 3D renders were kind of a esoteric art that were only done by a handful of people. And this was used in a fair number of games. So like, do you think this is going to open up more of those kind of mid nineties software rendered classics to, you know, more preservation efforts? Yeah. Is, is there a budding croc modding scene just, just waiting to be born? <laughs> Surprisingly. So shortly after open sourcing it, I got contacted by someone who's been working on a croc definitive edition for a while using a leaked copy of the source he got from one of the X programmers. And uh, they had a version of Brinder themselves, like a source version and, They've been making modifications for it over the years, and it's now got OpenGL support and things like that. So there actually are several communities for the games that it's used. Like, I've been in the Carmageddon modding community for a while. I haven't done much Carmageddon modding, you know, in a long while, but I know the people in it. And because of my interest in a similar, you know, Brender-based program, we have common interests. So they're very excited to have the version of Brender available, especially because this actually opens up the possibility that we might get the old Carmageddon games open source as well. Because apparently at one point, I mean, there's been several acquisitions since then, so who knows if this will still happen. The people behind Carmageddon were open to having it open sourced. Their only issue was that they don't own Brinder, and therefore they couldn't really open source the game, plus their modified version of Brinder, because they didn't own Brinder. Now that Brinder's open source, we might get Carmageddon, we might get Croc. There's several other games out there that could possibly join it now that the library behind them is open source. And I've been kind of reaching out to the companies where I can to ask about these kind of things, if they still have the source, if they're interested in open sourcing it, basically thinking that there's some momentum on this right now. You know, people have seen this news story. I've got, you know, publicity from that. This is the perfect time to ask. And it's also a notable time because it's like the early Windows 95 games, like post DOS stuff, pre DirectX 3 is kind of a weirdly difficult period of game to emulate. So a lot of these games are kind of, they're not exactly lost because people can still you can still get them, but they're difficult to play now. So so it's it's prime opportunity for the open sourcing community to come in and and kind of make cleaned up, modernized or easier to play versions of them, not modernized necessarily. Yeah, it's 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 a time where things in theory should work, but because of various compatibility problems, it's often very difficult to get them to work. Which is something that you know people who can use an open source version of it can get fixed pretty quickly, even without going as far as you know source ports like Doom has where they ported it to run an OpenGL and stuff, just a matter of fixing various compatibility bugs so that it'll just run on modern systems. Often it's something as simple as just, you know, getting rid of 16-bit installers, that kind of thing. So the application is written in C++, but it's also almost 30 years old. I mean, what has it been like sifting through almost 30-year-old code? I mean, just in terms of like coding practices and standards and things that have evolved since the mid-90s, like... Is there anything in there that's thrown you for a loop so far or that just kind of made you go like, wow, I can't believe they used to do things this way? Not so much in the code, but a bit in the kind of environment they've got set up. They're using like inmake files, which is the standard Visual Studio version of Make, but they're calling out to RM rather than Dell to delete the files. And it turns out it's because they are using some kind of Unix on Windows toolkit that was like a commercial product I'd never heard of that apparently worked better for them for this particular thing. And so it's kind of tricky to get those batch uh, files working again properly. There's also a lot of places where they're like, here, we're going to stick in some shims because we don't yet have the final version of the Windows 95 SDK. We're using a pre-release version. So we had to kind of, this is going to work when Windows 95 is out, but until then, we're just going to sort of hack it in right here for now. So there's there's been a little bit of work in sort of pulling those bits out to make this stuff easier to compile. Because right now we can compile it But it took about a week before anyone was able to get to a full compile for various reasons. And you have to be using a very specific version of Visual C++ to do it. It's 2.1. 2.0 is too too old. 2.2 is too new. It has to be 2.1 or it will not compile. Are there any plans afoot to take this thing cross-platform? Does that seem feasible? Or is it just too kind of Windows-centric to expect like a Mac or or Linux versions at any point? It's definitely very Windows-centric. There is actually some attempts at making it cross-platform within the code base because it's actually built on top of an uh, another library they'd used for um, Fine Artist and uh, Creative Writer, which ran on Macs as well. So there's some cross-platform stuff in there. But generally, the main program 
they kind of made it Windows specific just because it was being written by a bunch of Microsoft employees. It isn't inherently very Microsoft specific because it's a very sort of unique application. Like it doesn't use standard menus and such, but just because it was written by Microsoft employees, it inherently is very Windows. There is plans to make it cross-platform. I don't know how long that's going to take, but some of our projects and things we want to do with it are definitely going to require making it cross-platform, like getting it to run in the browser, for example. So I think eventually that's going to happen, but it's definitely not one of the first priorities because it's, it's, it's going to take a lot of work. I was going to say, what what is your long-term... I realize that this isn't... At this point, it's not really your project anymore, right? It's out in the, right. out in the world and people are just kind of doing what they think is cool. But like, what would you like to see? You mentioned browser compatibility for, I assume, playback of the scene files. Do you see a world where like this whole thing gets abstracted out and you can add your own content on one side and the playback is readily available for everybody to, to play whether they have the software or not? Like, What's your vision? So I actually did a Twitter thread kind of outlining my ideas for this. I've kind of got a two-phase project kind of inspired by Doom and what happened to it after it, it went open source and had you know various source ports. Source ports. The uh, the first step is basically to get it running on current systems and then sort of working on portability and fixing compatibility bugs. Because there's it, it still runs on Windows 10, but there's definitely stuff that doesn't run the same as it used to. We've got glitches where MIDI doesn't play properly. Plus, not everyone has a MIDI device anymore. You know, things like that. Where the first phase is basically just going to be make this easier to compile, make it more portable, fix those issues. And then that gives us a sort of basic kind of, if you just want the same experience you had back in 1995 for, you know, nostalgia reasons, you play this as a kid, you've got a version there. Then from there, my plan is to basically fork my own fork and start working on a 3D Movie Maker Plus edition, where there I'm doing, you know, more uh, experimental things, making it easier to like add in new textures, new 3D models, making it easy to export it out to something you can just put right on YouTube rather than, you know, a scene file. Things like that, where it's like, you know, all kinds of stuff that the community has come up with as, you know, this sure would be nice, but we can't do it. Stuff over the last 27 years, that'll be the fork where those kind of experiments go on. Sure. Uh, one of the modifications you mentioned on Twitter is that the original version runs in only 256 color mode. And you were thinking about uh, adding, you know, true color capability, which that, that's like a very sensible, but also like fairly modest upgrade. Is there any temptation like on your part or other, among other people in the community to, especially now that you have the rendering code, like just see how far you can take it with all the, you know, the capabilities of modern 3D accelerators, like just see how far you can push the graphics or is there, is there a sense that like taking it too far would kind of undermine what made it special in the first place? You know, that there's that kind of old Brian Eno quote about the limitations of media formats becoming like their kind of signature or hallmark traits. Yeah, definitely. And it's actually something I've kind of run into before with V3D Movie Maker, the V3D Mem project. The thing about making it possible to expand it is that if you just add ways to make it more complicated, you kind of inherently raise the difficulty curve because now the the sort of standard has shifted. The bar has been raised. And in my projects, at least, I kind of want to stick to something like the original limitations just so that this doesn't become another source filmmaker, another blender. I have to make sure I pronounce that properly because blender versus brender totally different programs. I don't want to make another program like that because those already exist. They're hard to use. They have a large learning curve. Yeah, plenty of people know them, but the nice thing about 3D Movie Maker is it's the perfect program to throw in front of, you know, an eight-year-old and just say, hey, why don't you make a movie? And just making it more extendable for, you know, the older kids, the, the adults in the audience to do more complicated things should never be done at the expense of making it harder for the kids to pick it up and play. I don't with think it. the eight year olds care about ray tracing. It turns out. <laughs> well, well, they should damn it. Actually, amusingly, um, uh, 3d movie maker is already partially ray traced because the backgrounds they used were created by uh, a company called illuminate and they, uh, ray traced them all, uh, in soft image actually. Oh, that's amazing. So you like to call yourself a hardware and software necromancer since you focus on literally resurrecting old hardware and software, which I think is a pretty legitimate label. But I feel like there's also an aspect of almost forensic kind of detective work to what you do. You know, you're, you're trying to do things like open up some long dead file format or like lifting data off of some old compromised like magnetic storage media. Uh, I'm just curious, where did you build up such a broad skill set that lets you approach so many different esoteric technical problems? 
Uh, I don't really have any like specific like uh, place where I got those or like any kind of specific training. It's kind of just been as I've needed skills, I've had to go and learn them. So, you know, just sort of various side projects. I've gotten good at things like I uh, open something up and I see a bunch of chips. Well, I know I need to take pictures of the chips up close and I've got a method for doing that, which which doesn't even use like a microscope or a macro camera. I kind of had just take them at an angle with a, ca- a light coming in at a diagonal. And then I know, you know, some tricks for how do I find out what this chip is? And then if I can't easily find out what this is, how, what can I guess about it based on, you know, how many pins does it have, where it's located, things like that. It's just practice, really, you know, having done this enough that I've had to sort of learn how to do these sort of things. Sure. You kind of practice in public, you know, you really exhaustively kind of document on Twitter what you're doing as you're doing it. How much of a community effort is it? I mean, are you relying on a lot of obscure knowledge from people who follow you and kind of chime in with like, oh, I know, the, like, I worked with that microcontroller 20 years ago. Here's what it does. Like, is there a lot of back and forth? with the people who follow your work? Uh, To some degree, yeah. I mean, it's kind of a mix. I mean, a lot of times I'm kind of just moving too fast to to really catch up on everybody talking, you know, back at me. It's kind of like a lot of times someone will go like, hey, oh, I think this one's something. And it's like, I'm already eight posts later and I figured that out and I've, you know, managed to dump the chip and that kind of thing. It's just a lot of times it's a matter of like, I've got the thing in front of me. I'm looking down at it playing with it, taking pictures, then I look up and just post some quick details, and then I look back down. So I don't always keep the um, the stuff up to date, but any project that goes on long enough, I definitely get a lot of interesting feedback. One example that happened a while back, I remember, and it relates back to Doom, because you mentioned that, I was looking into the question of when did the world figure out the cheat codes to the original Doom? Because I didn't like, publish them. They just put the game out and was like, here's the game, there's some cheat codes, we're not going to tell you what they are. And it turns out someone figured it out within a few days. And it turns out it was someone who had designed their own 32-bit DOS uh, reverse engineering suite and was working on that. And then they showed up in the thread a bit later. So it's like they, oh, wow. they're still around. Oh, that's amazing. With with like the archival part of this 3D Movie Maker project done and the source code available and, and on GitHub where anybody can grab it, What's your next target? Like, what are what's another piece of old software or game or hardware? What are you excited about after this? Uh, that's a good question because I, I kind of just have an endless list of stuff I've been... Often it's stuff that I've actually been asking about for a long while. I know when my thread first got big, a lot of people were confusing it with um, Windows Movie Maker, which is a completely different program. It's a kind of simple nonlinear editor, and a lot of people would love to have that. I haven't necessarily asked anyone at Microsoft about that. I imagine there's a lot of licensing issues with that one. But, you know, that's something people have asked about. People have also asked about Microsoft Bob a lot. (laughs) Not really sure why everyone wants Bob so much, but I've actually done some looking into Microsoft Bob for completely uh, unrelated reasons. So I know a little bit about it. But the things that I'm actually like personally interested in is Dynex or Dynex. Not really sure how to pronounce it. It's a library management system. It was used in the late 80s and 90s. Um, In a lot of libraries, they use like Weiss uh, dumb terminals for it. And it's something that is, I think, very nostalgic for my exact generation. People like five years younger than me have never heard of it, and people five years older than me never saw it. But my exact generation remembers it a lot, and it's been, I think, more so buried than any other software I've seen. Basically, the company that made it, who were also called Dynix, got acquired by another company, their main competitor, Circe, and they're now called Circe Dynix. But Circe Dynix basically wants you to think that Dynix never existed. So they are barely um, admit that it existed. As far as I can tell, there are no copies of it archived anywhere. And it, it seems like a great shame because it's so incredibly nostalgic to my exact generation. So I've been working on a project for a while where I've been basically emailing a bunch of librarians from libraries I know used to use Dynix on the idea of, hey, do you happen to have any like really old backup tapes sitting in a back room or anything? Because we would love to save at least one copy of Dynix, and you know, and I can help you get all the user data off it so that it's nice and clean and you're not leaking anything. But it's kind of one of those things where it's it seems like the only place this exists is within that company, and they do not want the world to see it. So. It's kind of a an, another sort of white whale project to chase. This is a little bit self-serving because it's you know, kind of serving my own passions, but uh, how about old operating systems? Do you have any interest there or do you see any potential there for getting a lot of old OSs potentially open source or at least made more available in some way? I mean, you see 
all the time in Linux, you know, somebody is working on some window manager to, re, you know, recreate like Next Step or SGI IREX or something like that. I mean, do you think there's much chance of going after some stuff like that? That's a good question. Um, it's definitely an area I'm interested in um, just because compatibility is such an issue with a lot of things where I feel like a lot of uh, the compatibility problems could be solved if we had, you know, source for them. Plus, a lot of things are, you know, are already distributed in source form. It, it's you kind of need the source to be able to, you know, bring them back in any form at all. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely an area area I'm interested in, but not one I've been I've had much chance to sort of actively uh, pursue. I have a roommate who's actually been looking into um, getting some old PDP-10 operating systems. The Computer History Museum has some of those because she actually has an uh, original node from the CompuServe like information system and is trying to get it back up and running. And it's, it's one of those things where it's like, at this point, it's we have a hard drive, we have a computer, but do we have the documentation on how to bootstrap the thing? No. So... It's about, you know, figuring out how to get this thing all up and running and talking to other nodes and how would you be able to dial into it and that kind of thing. That's absolutely fascinating. Like that kind of stuff, because it's a time when people didn't really, like everything was moving so fast that there was there, there was very little value placed on the thing that was two years old or three years old in a lot of cases. And, and a lot of those early pre-ISP network services kind of just got gobbled up by ISPs and then disappeared. Right, right. Do you think, there, is there nostalgia for like the AOL generation? I mean, I, I'm sure there must be for the people who grew up on AOL and CompuServe and Delphi and all that stuff to jump back in and play the the old games and see the old communities that were there. Definitely. I mean, like I know that uh, people are working on trying to get some parts of Prodigy back online. And there are parts of Prodigy I remember seeing back in the 90s where it's those things that I remember seeing, they're just gone. No, They were never archived anywhere as far as we can tell, and they're just vanished in the ether. So I think there's a lot of sort of locked up nostalgia for that kind of era where it's people just want, you know, would love to just see it again, and they can't because it was never, you know, archived in that kind of way. If you told the kid version of you who was using Windows 3D Movie Maker, or 3D Movie Maker, rather, that this software was going to be open source and you'd be able to hack at the source code and, and make it the way you wanted it to be, what would kid use reaction have been? Yeah, Kid Me would have been very happy about that because basically from the moment I was learning programming, it was to hack on 3D Movie Maker. Prior to this, all I can think of is like occasionally thinking about making video games. But 3D Movie Maker, like I, my first stuff for 3D Movie Maker were written in QBasic. Then I learned Visual Basic and then I had to learn C++ and then x86 assembly all to keep reverse engineering and modifying 3D Movie Maker. So this has kind of been a sort of lifelong project for me to keep modifying it and, you know, sort of keep going things on. And, you know, at the moment, I'm kind of in a sort of more community manager type position where it's mainly about talking to a bunch of people rather than doing most of the coding, sort of managing like, you know, uh, different repos and changes people are making, that kind of thing. But it's kind of been an on and off thing for over 20 years now, so... Uh, this is definitely something that's making the inner child of me very happy. This is kind of your origin story, but were you aware of open source at that point in your life? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think I had a kind of vague idea about it, but probably like when I first touched the program, you'd have to explain what open source was first, but then I would have been on board. Yeah. Because like uh, the, the, around that time, I was still, you know, l learning programming through like reading books in the library. And my particular library had a bunch of books from the 80s. So it was all kind of like the kind of basic stuff where you have to type in the program from the back of the book kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, I totally would have gotten on board with that. Like, so, oh, yeah, like the stuff where you, you're typing in and then you've got a little simple game, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Just much bigger. So I, I would have gotten it. But I don't know if the term open source would have made sense to me yet. Okay, Foon, you've established some precedent for open sourcing historically important or interesting software. Is there anyone you'd like to hear from that you that you don't know already? Like, who holds the keys that you'd like to hear from, you know, in the software context next? Yeah, so like in terms of like, you know, open sourcing and things like that, I'm always happy to talk with people about the steps to take to get, you know, so old software uh, open sourced. I also would love to hear from people who just simply have old software that they don't necessarily have the legal right to open source, because those are exactly the kind of things that would be great to, you know, be put somewhere like at the Internet Archive behind closed doors just so that it's preserved. Because if you're the only person who has it, you're only one, you know, 
dead hard drive or a house fire away from it just being gone forever. If it's been um, copied around the world, then put in backups, even if it's not public, that's going to make sure it's preserved so that you later have the chance to open source it. Um, that's actually how Brinder got this way, because when I made that original thread asking about uh, getting through Movie Maker open sourced and how Brinder wasn't open sourced, Jez San, the uh, CEO of Argonaut, showed up and said that they would love to open source it. Unfortunately, they didn't have the source code, to which I got to reply, that's great. I've got the source code. <laughs> the code so is not the right. Get in touch. Yeah, yeah. They weren't supposed to have it, or I wasn't supposed to have it. But, you know, there was somebody who kept on the copy after working on it somewhere else, and they leaked it to me, basically, for research purposes. So because I had that copy, and then it turns out other people had other copies, we were able to actually open source it. So uh, I'm very much a fan of that sort of thing. And, like, I've worked with, you know, people at the Internet Archive before about we can upload stuff and then keep it hidden. You know, it doesn't need to go public right now, but just having it preserved somewhere so that later down the road the company can decide to open source it, I think is very important. That seems like something as, as time continues to pass, that seems like something that may end up happening more and more. I mean, like in the game space, like we just had this Duke Nukem Forever leak in the last few days. Oh yeah. And both the publisher and developer have come out and said, we have no idea where this came from. It seems legitimate, but they don't seem mad about it. You know, it's not like they're out there trying to issue takedowns or anything like that. It's like, this is old enough fine you know like that seems to be the attitude kind of it's like okay it's out there you know it's like yeah securing the material is the important part and you can kind of always backfill the legality after the fact exactly yeah i I, like i've said before is that like one of the reasons i'm i'm so interested in archiving everything now is that it's it's a one-way door it's like if you decide to archive it now and then we not release it now that's fine but if we decide to release it later but we didn't archive it now that's no good it's gone we didn't. We don't have it anymore, and we can always decide we don't need it later. But right now is the only time these things exist, and so much stuff is stored on old hard drives, old floppy disks that are just slowly dying to magnetic fields fading away. That I'm, I'm always very happy to help get things backed up. Like I do a lot of uh, imaging of floppy disks for this exact reason, because as uh, Jason Scott said, you know, floppy disks are at the point where a lot of them will just simply not be there in twenty years. So we better be archiving them now because they will all just be blank. Yeah. And and I think that that's an admirable – as somebody who grew up computing in this time, it's lovely to have folks like you doing this work so that we have access to these resources in the future. So, Foon, this is the time where you plug stuff. Uh, where can people find you? What would you like people to read? If they would like to learn more about this, where should they go and, and what should they dig into? Uh, well, my Twitter is the main place right now, just Foon, F-O-O-N-E, on Twitter. Um, I have a wiki at foon.org, which has a lot of other links. I try to keep that updated. And my other like, sort of major personal project I'd like to plug is deathgenerator.com. It's a project I've been working on for several years now where I use a lot of those same reverse engineering skills where I basically pull images out of old video games and I built a simple tool to let you make basically fake video game screenshots. Wow. It's the kind of stuff that you could, you, could, you could put together yourself in Photoshop in 10 minutes without much trouble, but the thing is, this the tool makes it possible to do it in 30 seconds. So it's kind of the perfect, you know, sort of shitposting machine where you can just sort of throw it into Castlevania, Mega Man, Mario, that kind Such of thing. Such classics as Surf Ninjas. Yeah, yeah. can I ask, do you have it set to serve up a random game because I got Blackthorn and I was just playing the 32X version of Blackthorn like five days ago? Yeah, yeah. The UI actually does need a lot of work, but at the moment you, you hit the, the front page, it just, it just randomly picks a game. And it's like, here you go. Uh, it's got a kind of funny name, the Death Generator, but it started out as the Sierra Death Generator because Sierra Games always loved to pop up a, well, you're dead, you shouldn't have done that, you know, restore, restart, quit kind of box. And I started with that, but within like a couple of days, I'll, I realized, hang on, I could expand this to just about any game with text in it. So I rapidly started adding games that no longer fit the, the theme. This is spectacular, Foon. Thank you so, so much for joining us and talking about this. And we'd love to have you back sometime. This was fabulous. Yeah, this has really been a pleasure. Well, thank you for having me. It was fun. Thank you so much, Foon. Uh, it's been a wonderful conversation. We hope you come back sometime and talk about whatever your next big project ends up being. And if you're on Twitter, throw Foon a follow. The, their posts and their feed is always a source of interesting information and no small amount of nostalgic joy for me. So yes, endlessly entertaining. If you just want, if you like watching people dig through just old technical minutia and figuring out all kinds of wild stuff. I mean, I, I've seen them load up old hard drives from the 80s that still had all the data on there from some like. 
I don't know, accounting firm or something. Like, I've seen them literally sift through emails from the late 80s that they lifted off of old hard drives, and it's just fascinating. It's like a slice of life and culture in addition to the technical stuff. So that'll do it for us this week. As always, the FosPod is brought to you by Google Open Source. They bring all the power of open source to Google and all the power of Google to open source. You can find out more about Google Open Source at opensource.google. The FosPod is brought to you by us, uh, Brad and me, Will. Yes. This is always awkward. We need a better way to do this. <laughs> our producer is Matt Purdy, and our editor is Sabrina Hill. We welcome all feedback and comments at FosPod at conduct.town, and we'll be back in two weeks with the next edition of The FosPod. See you all then.